I feel on this series on Be Sober and Be Vigilant, not because there isn't a whole lot of other things we could talk about, but I think, as we mentioned, brother, can you tone me down just a touch? Uh, I'm hearing myself about three times, and <laughs> but uh, that's good, thanks. Uh, but not because there aren't many other things that we could talk about, but as we talked about a few weeks ago on Sunday nights, we're going to be starting three, or going to be progressively working through t- three different series on uh, the life of Noah, the life of Daniel, and then really the life of the early church as we look at the book of Acts. And we'll see these things and others brought together into practical application, how things were done, how things were, uh, and how to apply the things that we've been learning about in this series. Uh, So please don't think, as we probably, Lord willing, will wrap this up next week, don't think that's the end of the discussion. we got a lot more coming. We're just going to be hitting it in a little bit of a different light. Uh, a little bit of a different way and then in, the, in addition to that even on Sunday mornings as we uh, starting in the new year uh, we'll be starting in the book of Ephesians uh, again and, and again what we'll see is a lot of the things that we've talked about brought into a sharper focus uh, to help us uh, apply the things that we've been learning about and, and how to do some of the things especially some of the things that we've been talking about as we look at the armor. But if you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me to Ephesians chapter number 6, and we'll begin reading again verse number 13 down through verse number 20. Tonight's focus, of course, will be really on verse number 17. But Ephesians chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and For me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. Father, I ask tonight that you would again just hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Father, help me to share the truths that you'd have me to share tonight. And Father, may may it be done in such a way that the Holy Spirit of God can use it to strengthen us and to help us as Christians be the soldiers in this spiritual warfare that you'd have us to be. Father, I thank you for the truth that we find here. But just give me a clear thought as I try to share these things that it would be a blessing and a help and an encouragement. And we'll thank you now for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For the last couple of weeks, we've been really studying this particular passage and and looking at the different pieces of armor. And today, in verse number 17, we're focusing in on two specific pieces, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So far, as we've studied the armor that Christ provides, we've seen that the belt of truth provides discernment. And the breastplate of righteousness bolsters our confidence, not in our own righteousness, but in the fact that we have been made righteous and are seen as righteous by the Father through the righteousness of Christ that has been given to us. The sandals of the preparation of of the gospel uh, strengthens the conviction that we need to stand our ground because we realize and we recognize that there is no plan B. There's only one way to be saved. There's only one way to the Father. And if we truly believe that and we understand that, then we will stand in that truth and fight for what we know is the truth when it comes to the salvation of others. Then we saw the shield of faith provides the trust that we need uh, as we face the enemy. Over and over again, we've talked about the fact that it talks about the whole armor and the fact that we can't go into the battle half-dressed. And And we have to avail ourselves of every piece of the armor uh, that Christ provides. And we actually have a vivid illustration of that going all the way back to the Roman Empire and the things that caused the Roman Empire to actually fall. 
You all know I'm a history buff, and I love to get into this kind of thing. And I have an eight-volume set at home uh, written by Edward Gibbon. And the title of that series is The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. This is uh, volume two in the set that I have. I think originally there were six volumes, and later editions broke it down, broke a couple of them down into smaller works. But this is actually the second, uh, the, excuse me, this is the third uh, volume in that series. And as I was studying, I was reminded of something, and I found a quote in this book. I want to read this to you, so listen very carefully. It is the just and important observation of Vegetius, who was a, a, somebody living there when the Roman Empire fell, that the infantry or the foot soldier or the Roman soldiers that we're talking about here in this passage, that the infantry was invariably covered with defensive armor from the foundation of the city, the foundation of the Roman Empire, to the reign of the emperor Gratian. The relaxation of discipline. And the disuse of exercise rendered the soldiers less able and less willing to support the fatigues of the service. They complained, now get this, they complained of the weight of the armor which they seldom wore. And they successfully obtained the permission of laying aside both the cuirasses, which is the breastplate, and their helmets. Okay, the heavy weapons of their ancestors, the short sword and the formidable pilum, which had subdued the world, insensibly dropped from their feeble hands. As the use of the shield is is incompatible with that of the bow, they reluctantly marched into the field, condemned to suffer either the pain of wounds or the ignominy of flight, and always disposed to prefer the more shameful alternative. In other words, they ran. The cavalry of the Goths, the Huns, and the Alani had felt the benefits and adopted the use. The enemy adopted the use of defensive armor. And as they excelled in the management of missile weapons, they easily overwhelmed the naked and trembling legions whose heads and breasts were exposed without defense to the arrows of the barbarians. The enervated soldiers abandoned their own and the public defense. Now, I'm going to read this, and then I'll tell you what it means, okay? And their pusillanimous indolence. Anybody got a clue what that means? (laughs) Their pusillanimous indolence. In other words, their cowardly laziness. But don't pusillanimous indolence just sound worse? And their pusillanimous indolence may be considered as the immediate cause of the downfall of the empire. Not only does this passage stress that lack of wearing the whole armor led to the fall of the Roman Empire, it also stresses the importance of the helmet two or three different times in this passage. And that's our first stop this evening in verse number 17. And take the helmet of salvation. Now, It's not hard at all to understand the helmet was the piece of armor uh, that protected the head. But the question that we have to ask is why would salvation be associated with our heads and, and not our hearts, for instance? And I think the key is understanding the place that the helmet has within the overall defensive armor of the Christian. Ultimately, the helmet was the last line of defense for the soldier. The shield that we talked about last time, if you remember, was the front line of defense. If Satan shoots a fiery dart your way, you hold up the shield of faith to quench it. You do that by trusting in all that God is for you and by trusting in the promises that God has made you. Romans chapter number 8, verses 31 through 39, again, drives that reality home. What shall we say then, or what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? 
It is God that justifieth. Who is, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's our shield right there. But sometimes the battle rages hard and the battle rages heavy. We find ourselves being shot, shot at over and over again with temptation after temptation or trial after trial. And it just seems like the barrage is never going to end. And we start to falter and we start to struggle. And then we fall into either a sinful way of thinking or sometimes we may fall even into a sinful course of action. And then the devil really ramps things up. He gets past that shield of faith. And then he starts whacking you. If you was really a Christian, you wouldn't be fighting like this. If you was really a Christian, you wouldn't even have to be worrying about this. Something must be wrong with you and your Christian walk. God must not love you as much as he loves everybody else. Because if he cared for you and if he really was your Savior like you say that he is, you probably wouldn't have to be fighting with this. Whack, whack. He's got through the shield. And now he's going for the head. But we've got the helmet of salvation. The biggest attack that Satan has for the Christian is is to try to convince them that they're not really saved. Because if he can convince you or make you doubt whether or not you're saved, then you're going to start trying to get out of the battle. Right? So he's gotten through that shield. Now, again, the helmet, think about this. The helmet is not the first line of offense or or the first line of defense. It's not. I don't know how many of y'all ever watched any of the Rocky movies. First couple, three wasn't bad. After that, they kind of went, Pfft. but the first couple of them wasn't bad. But there's the, the one, the, the one that, that, that was kind of fun just because of the Cold War and everything else was the one with Ivan Drago, the Russian guy. Remember? This is true. Sylvester Stallone, not Rocky, but Sylvester Stallone, told uh, whatever that dude's name is, told him. I want you to really hit me. That was stupid. (laughs) Made for great film, but it was stupid. But we have to understand, we've got this shield of faith, so we don't have to take the headshots. But occasionally the battle just gets so hard. We're fighting something. It may, be the, it may be something with our health. It may be something with a relationship. It may be something with a situation at work. It may be something in my family. It may be whatever it is. And he's fired and he's fired and he's fired and he's fired. And finally you fall into one side and the shields drop. And then he goes after you. If you, wouldn't, if you, wouldn't, if you was a Christian, this wouldn't be happening to you. But you wear the helmet of salvation. And that helmet of salvation is simply this. You can know that you know that you know that you truly are saved. You may be down on one knee. 
You may be taking headshot after headshot, and the devil may be doing everything he can to convince you that if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't feel this way. If you were really a Christian, you wouldn't have done that. If you were really a Christian, you wouldn't be having these troubles. But here's the truth, folks. You can look the devil right in the eye if you know that you've accepted Christ as your Savior and say, you can say what you want, you can do what you want, but I'm telling you now, I am a child of the King. And I may go down, but all that means is, is I'm, going to be, I'm going to be lifted right back up. That's the helmet of salvation. It's the assurance that when everything else has failed, even if I have lost, and don't get me wrong when I say this, I am not talking about losing your salvation. I'm talking about losing the faith that you need to stand in the battle because the battle has been so hard. And it's been going on for so long that even when you get to the point that you just don't think you've got the faith to fight anymore, the one thing you can hold on to beyond all shadow of a doubt is I know that I'm saved. That's the helmet of salvation. It's not the first line of defense, but thank God it's there. Because when everything else falls, you can still rely on the fact that you've got your helmet on and that no matter what the devil throws at you you're still saved so the helmet provides the assurance that we need to not surrender in the battle Did you get that it's the assurance that we need to not surrender in the battle it didn't I'm not saying you're not taking blows to the head <laughs> I'm saying that it gives you the assurance to not surrender even when it seems like your faith has fallen to the ground. But we also have a way to fight back when the temptations and the trials are flying. And that's with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. Now, the Greek word for this particular sword is the Greek word makaria. And this is a replica, how I wish that they'd really dug this thing out of the ground. <laughs> but this is a replica, an, off, an accurate replica of a Roman short sword. It's double-edged, you know, the two-edged sword. This is it, double-edged. And this is an accurate representation of a sword from that time period. They actually had two. They had the great big broadsword that basically you had to have two hands to fight with. But that's not really a good sword if you're an infantryman. Because you've already got that heavy shield. If you had to have a two-handed sword and a shield, what are you going to do? So the Macaria, which is this one, is a short sword. You could wear it on your belt. And you could use it as an offensive and a defensive weapon. One, defensively, you've got your shield and the devil's got one of those spears and he's flinging it at you. You block it and you cut off the end. Defensive weapon. But the main purpose of this thing was hand-to-hand -hand or close, in, close quarters. I won't get hand-to-hand is the right word, but close quarters combat. This was not a cutting tool. You could use it that way. But that wasn't its main reason or main use. This sucker was a stab, <laughs> a stabbing weapon. You'd take that sucker and you'd go right through whatever was in front of you. And because it was double-edged, it cut both ways when you put it in there, and it cut both ways when you pulled it back out. And on top of that, if you got into really close combat, this knob on the end... headshot <laughs> so that's what this thing looks like and that's what the Bible's talking about here when it's talking about the sword of the spirit which is the word of God now as we talked about when we were, when we were in our study on how to study the Bible that series that we spent so much time on 
the definition or the meaning of words can be very important. We've talked about that repeatedly through that series. And, and when you study the Word of God, you see that there are actually two Greek words that are primarily used to describe the Scriptures. One is the Greek word logos, or logos, depending on how you pronounce it. And the other is the word rhema. Now, the word logos, or logos, speaks of the Word of God in its entirety. The whole counsel of God, the, the Word of God as a total unit, okay? But the word rhema is more about specific sayings, verses, or maybe even passage, passages that deal with a particular theme. And the word used here in Ephesians 6 and verse number 17 is the word rhema. It's talking about specific passages of Scripture called upon at the appropriate time for a particular kind of attack. Now, the greatest example of this is, of course, Christ's temptation in the wilderness. Three times when we see Satan attack Christ, and three times he strikes back with a specific verse that was appropriate for that particular temptation. Uh, the first one, when he was tempted to end his fast before the appropriate time, Christ responded with, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. When he was attacked uh, to avoid, when he was tempted to avoid the cross and lay aside the role of faith in the life of his followers by jumping off of the temple, Christ answered with, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. When tempted to avoid the cross and accept the kingdoms of the world by bowing to Satan, Christ again declared, Get thee hence, Satan, it is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Specific verses for specific temptations. That is the rhema of God that's being talked about right here. What we have to understand, and boy, I saw this in one of my commentaries, and I love H.A. Ironside. And I was reading H.A. Ironside, and he said this, and I tried my best to figure out how to get a whole quote of his stuff in here because it was just such a wonderful thing. But basically what he said is, is that the Logos, the entire Word of God, is an armory. It's an entire storehouse of swords, individual ramas, whether that's a verse or whether it's a passage of Scripture, that can be used to fight a particular battle, to fend off a particular temptation, or to help you in a particular trial. Can you see how powerful a weapon that we have in the Word of God? It's not just the Word of God. It's also the individual things we need to fight off all of the battles that, or all of the temptations and all of the trials that Satan brings our way. But here's the key. Key. The key for getting into the logos or getting into the armory so that you can access all of the different swords that you need is study. That's the key to get in to the armory. You have to know what the Word of God says so that you can grab the right sword for the right battle. Does that make sense? John 3.16, just to give you an example. John 3.16 is a great rhema if the devil tries to tempt you into believing that God would have never saved you or that God could never possibly save you. The devil comes to you and says, well, you've got to be lost anyway because God would never save you given the things that you've done in your life. Rhema, for God so loved the world. And as last time I checked, I'm still in this world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Sorry, devil, I'm saved. Rhema. But can you imagine if the devil's tempting you to cheat on your spouse and you go, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What's that got to do with anything? You see? John 3.16 is not a good sword if you're being tempted to cheat on your spouse. John 3.16 is not a good sword if you're tempted to take something from work that's not yours. 
You need a different rhema. You need a different sword. You need something like Ephesians chapter number 5, starting in verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself the devil says cheat on your spouse and you say i can't ephesians 5 tells me that i'm the i'm a husband and i represent christ and christ would never do such a thing and because of that i stand on the truth of god and i'm not going to either that's the rhema of the word but that's also the problem with most Christians today and I'm not being I'm not trying to be critical but I'm trying to help us here you remember the old children's song deep and wide most Christians today are about a thousand miles wide and a quarter inch deep to be perfectly honest we know about 20 or 30 verses of Scripture, and we try to fight off hundreds and thousands of attacks of the devil with those 20 or 30 verses. And most of the time, those verses ain't got a thing in the world to do with the attack that we're facing at the time. And then we wonder why we don't have any power with God. Now, am I saying, and I looked this up just because I was curious, am I saying that you need to memorize all 31,173 verses of the Bible? No, of course not. But you should be familiar enough with your Bible that even if you can't remember a verse word for word, you know enough of it to look it up or at least to stand on its truth when the devil throws a temptation or trial your way or at the very least you should know how to study your Bible so that you can find the help that you need so that you can unlock the armory to get to the right sword. We need to be able to know roughly what's in each book and what each book is about. We need to know key verses and we need to know key chapters of each book. So the word or the rhema of God can be a great defensive tool. The devil comes at you, you grab the sword and you block it off. But what about as an offensive weapon? How can we use the sword to take the battle to Satan? One commentator that I was reading said this, and I liked it. I really did. And so I did quote this one. I'm going to read this to you. Just listen to what he says. And this is him talking. We need to sit around. And, and what he was talking about, by the way, and I thought, he was, how many of y'all going back to the deep and wide, how many of you remember sword drills? Okay. This is what he said. He said, we need to sit around as adults now. That's what he's talking about. We need to sit around and drill each other. We won't do this today, but what if we sat around? Now, this is going into the offensive side. But what if we sat around and I said, Bible's high. Or, you know, attention, whatever, it is, whatever phrase you use to get people started. Every church does it a little bit different. The Bible's high. Okay. A Jehovah's Witness has just knocked on your door, and he's telling you that Jesus Christ was just a God. He was actually not God himself. Where would you turn in Scripture? Charge. The answer, John 1, Mark 2, Luke 18. Just some of the ramus, right? Or a co-worker has gone through some troubling times in her life and she walks up to you someday and says, you're a Christian, right? What must I do to get to heaven? What would you tell her? What verses would you show her? Do you know? Again, answers, John 3, 16, John 5, 24, John 6, 47, 1 John 5, verses 11 through 13. Or what if you're talking to your neighbor someday and he says, hey, you know, I'm a pretty good person. I haven't done too many bad things. God will probably let me into heaven, don't you think? What would you tell him? Can you think of a few verses that would show him the truth? Matthew 5, James, 2 through, uh, James chapter 2, verse 10. Just as examples. Now that's the end of his quote. 
But I like that. I think that's pretty cool. That's studying the Bible, the logos. So you know which passage or rhema to grab when it's time to fight the lies and the deceptions of the Bible or of the devil. But it all starts with studying. As the familiar words of 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be truly perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That's the armory, right? But then we read in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the rhema. That's going to the right sword at the right time for the battle that you find yourself in at the moment. Rightly dividing, correctly handling. And in, East, and in, my, ten, in my East Tennessee etymology, grabbing the right sword. The word of God. But the question is, does that describe you and me tonight? The belt of truth provides discernment. The breastplate of righteousness bolsters our confidence. The sandals of the preparation of the gospel strengthens the conviction that we need to stand our ground. The shield of faith provides the trust we need as we face the enemy. The helmet of salvation gives us assurance that we truly are saved. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, gives us the offense that we need to fight Satan. But can you say tonight, Brother Tim, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm saved. If the devil gets through my shield of faith... I can still stand because I know that I'm his and he's mine. Can you say tonight, Brother Tim, I study the word of God and I know that when Satan attacks, I have enough swords in my armory that I can fight him off or I can even, and I can even take the battle to him sometimes when I need to. If you can't say either of those things tonight, won't you come? Maybe you need assurance. Maybe you need to commit yourself to a focused and a determined effort in studying the Word of God so that you can go on the offensive and have an effective defense when Satan attacks. As we stand with our heads bowed, Brother Wallace comes to play softly. Father, how I thank you for the truth of your word, both the logos and the rhema, the whole armory and every individual sword. Father, how I thank you for the assurance that you give us in your word. First John is a great example that shows us how we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we truly are saved. So how I thank you for the assurance of salvation, that helmet that protects us as a last line of defense when it seems like everything else is falling apart. But Father, 